I'm an East Shroff, and I'm chopping it up with Buck. So, got to bring back, like I had moves on here, I started thinking, I got to get a niche on. You know, chopping it up with Buck came about sitting around during COVID, saying, let me call my boys and we just talk. So, Bilotti's been on, Lugs has been on, I'm with the other guys, Kevin Carter, but Anish Shroff, how you doing, man? I'm good, Buck. Good to finally uh, get this coveted invite. <laughs> so, I'm going to just tell you, Anish, when I first met you, I was like, man, this dude, Syracuse, I didn't know what to expect, right? I thought you were going to be a little pompous, you know. Uh, you guys have a great tradition up there. But, man, we hit it off pretty well because we started talking books. I love that about you because sometimes you would just throw things. I was like, well, where did you get that one from? I like it. And we would <laughs> bounce off of each other when we worked in the studio. But tell me how you started your progression from Bloomberg, New Jersey, or uh, excuse me, Bloomfield, New Jersey, into broadcasting and how that all come about. Yeah, well, you know, um, not all of us can be, um, you know, six foot five tight ends in the NFL, right? So, <laughs> um, or or center field for the Yankees or, or point guard for the Knicks. So, um, yeah, the dream took a detour. Um, but I think yeah. at a young age, I always had a passion for sports, and I always enjoyed the storytelling. Um, yeah. yeah, I tell the story a lot. You know, we never had cable as a kid. So I'd listen to a lot of radio and, and okay. you're forced to use your imagination. You're forced to picture things. Yeah. And then when I did watch sports on TV, it was a lot of national broadcast. And, you know, one of the things that I remember struck me when I was, when I was young was the old NBA on NBC. And yeah. I would always try to get to the TV. This is pre DVR, obviously for that Bob Costas game open where he really sets the scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you have the images, and, and he would make the words come alive with, with what you're yeah. saying on screen. And I always thought, man, what a great way of, of just telling a story and bringing it into a broadcast, making it feel big. And, you know, I think as a kid, you like that because it gave you the goosebumps. But the older I got, and I, as I got through high school, you know, you, you started to appreciate the art behind it yeah yeah, and yeah when i went to college you know those are the things that were implanted in your head and so that's where the seeds really started um where you kind of said hey this is sports but it's also a chance for us to to tell some great stories and to make yeah. people feel a certain way you know you you bring up a really good point uh you were a really good tennis player in high school you uh, I would say good. I was, I was eight. <laughs> so you couldn't, I, I think if you and Prim played, it would be competitive. Or... <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Nope. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but the thing about stories that you bring up is I remember sneaking to, to watch Monday night football past halftime when I was growing up and Howard Cosell. And, you know, he, and you talk about a guy that could embellish, but he brought you into it. And then all the other things that were around, I love football. But it was something about storytelling because my grandfather was a great storyteller. Uh, he would always talk about the Negro League players and just base. He loved baseball. So my first love was baseball. And I agree with you. When, whenever we have worked, that was the one thing I always liked because we had a chance to talk stories. We had a chance to kind of dig in and, that, you know, talk about the human interest piece of, of folks. And, you know, the other interesting thing about you, your parents are from Mumbai. Your dad is a a, a professional photographer. So tell me about that, because that's that's really interesting. My daughter's an artist, and I'm always intrigued by those that grow up with artists or grow up with people that can, that, that's a storytelling method as well. Yeah, and I got a lot from him, because when I was a kid, to make a few extra bucks, I would go work weekends with him. Yeah. Um, he would go shoot a wedding. He used to have his own photo studio. He started one of the uh, first 100 mini labs in the okay. country. That's yeah. where he developed the film, the one hour photo. He developed his own stuff. He used to make his own filters and um, really had a, a knack and a skill. And, and, you know, he's been featured in galleries and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, he kind of got into the wedding business just because, you know, it was a way to make a few extra bucks on weekends. And I would, you know, go help him out and I would hold the light. And, and the one thing that I noticed was, you know, it's, it's sort of the same in our business, right? 
our viewers, our listeners, they see the final product. Mm -hmm. but they sometimes see what goes into it. It's the old iceberg analogy. We see the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and I remember, you know, he would get me up early and I'm like, Dad, you know, this thing doesn't start until one o'clock. Why are you getting there at 7 a.m.? But that created a type of work ethic in me where I would see what he would do. He would get there at 7 a.m. He had all his equipment and he would just kind of go in and scout. Say, okay, mm. what's going on here? Are we set up the light here? Okay, they're going to walk in this way. And yeah. we're picturing everything before it happens. Mm -hmm. And then would set everything up and then things would happen. But it also allowed him a chance when things went in a different direction and didn't go as planned to adapt and adjust because mentally he would just prepare for different scenarios. Oh, well, you know, the forecast didn't call for rain, but now it's going to rain. What am I going to do? Okay. This is a, <laughs> like, indoors. If we need to take portrait pictures, we can take it here. There's good natural lighting. You know, I'll bring this, I'll bring this always having a backup plan. So I kind of got that. From him, and then just this idea of thinking visually thinking in a way where just because everybody is going right, doesn't mean you need to go right. Sometimes the best picture mm. is left. And sometimes I'm like, why is he going out here? And then I'd see the picture at the end. Oh, okay. I see what you did there. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Shooting things in a different way, shooting it from your back, shooting it through trees, finding mm. different ways to crop the picture. And so, you know, I was into photography, but never at the level that he was. And so for yeah. me, it was always, all right, how can I do this with a thousand words? <laughs> right. Like, <okay, laughs> yeah, picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to do it with the thousand words. And it was, how can we find a different way to get into this game? How can we find a different way to tell the story? One of my biggest pet peeves as a broadcast, and you've probably been a part of this, is when you come on the air and someone says to the analyst, well, hey, Buck, uh, yeah, this should be one heck of a game. Like, you know, <laughs> that's the cop out. That's like just taking a yeah. ball. Away. And, um, you know, the other thing I learned from him, and this was a lesson, especially early in my career, his big pet peeve from clients when they would ask what camera he would use, <laughs> like, you can have the best camera in the world, but if you're not a photographer or you can't see what you're supposed to see or you see things a certain way, what, what difference does it make? Yeah, and so he would say, yeah. you're not paying for my camera. You want a great camera, go buy one or have your uncle buy one and take your pictures. <laughs> you're paying me for how I see through the camera, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. I learned that even, you know, those old throwaway disposable yeah. cameras, with the right eye, you can take really good pictures through those. Well, and so, well you know what's, what's crazy? People are now using Polaroid. They're going back to Polaroid pictures and doing some pretty cool things with them. You know, it's, just, it's, just, it's amazing how that stuff has kind of come full circle. Yeah, yeah. And, and the analogy is, you know, depending on where we are or what yeah. games we're doing at certain times or at certain points in our careers, you're trying to do more with less. You may not yes. have all the bells and whistles. How can you still dress it up? How can you take that creative artistic picture with that disposable camera? So that that's kind of something that I learned from him. Well, and you talk about more with less. So I, I've watched your Syracuse guys because I've called plenty of games there, right? Yeah. I think you guys all go to W A E R. Is that the is that yeah. 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 football, basketball, and lacrosse? We'll talk football and basketball because you know Syracuse had had some down years, but they had been very strong before you got had gotten there. But it's interesting when during your time, you became a really proficient person and got into the nuances with lacrosse. Because that's kind of how I saw you. I was like, oh, this guy's really good and he's excitable. Before I knew you and, you know, before I knew really about you, I knew you loved lacrosse. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, so lacrosse was a foreign language to me when I got to college. Yeah. And I wanted to do football and I wanted to do basketball. And so at WAER, we were told, okay, you want to do those two? Learn lacrosse. <laughs> you got to do that first. Uh, so yeah. I remember my freshman year, I bought this Bob Scott book. He's a former Johns Hopkins coach, and it's essentially lacrosse for dummies before they had the yeah. subject for dummies series. So I got that book, and I, and I have it on my bookshelf behind me. And a few years ago, leafing through it, some of the things that I underlined, you know, this is how many players on the field. This is the side of the <laughs> biggest thing. I, I literally didn't know anything. And yeah. then in New York, we also had a vibrant high school lacrosse scene. 
and it yes, was covered yes. by the local news and the local TV stations, um, almost like you would cover high school football in yeah, the fall. Yeah. And a lot of those players would go play at Syracuse or at big division one schools. So I'd go to those high school games with a tape recorder, do practice tapes. But probably the biggest thing, we had a player when I was there by the name of Mikey Powell. Mm -hmm. He is on the Rushmore of college lacrosse. If you watch his highlight reel, you know, it's a cross section of Pete Maravich, and Wayne Gretzky, just a magician. Yeah. And he's one of the three or four greatest players in the history of college lacrosse. His four years coincided with mine. So you're watching this transcendent talent for four years up close. So you go from covering the sport because you have to. And then yeah. after four years, you're walking away as a true fan of the sport. Because, again, you got to watch an all-time talent. Well, you know, you bring up a really good point. I grew up in Texas, so I didn't know about lacrosse. I knew about Jim Brown, but I knew about lacrosse before then studying Native American history. Yeah. And so that was always one of those things that I was a guy that now when I watch lacrosse, I go see it, see the high school. I love it. I mean, I love the game. I love the physicality. But I think, you know, you, you can attest to this from being at Syracuse. There's talk that Jim Brown was probably one of the greatest lacrosse players of all time, along with Mikey Powell. And probably could have been if it was a pro uh, lacrosse league, would have been, you know, uh, a Hall of Famer in that as well. Well, if you listen to Jim Brown, he often says lacrosse was his first love. You know, that was yeah. his favorite sport. And he used to have a move that is now outlawed where he would pin the stick against his chest and literally <laughs> yeah. run through people. They call that a bull dodge. And they said, you can't you can't do that. Anymore. Uh, that sounds like a rodeo term down in Texas. <laughs> i tell you what. There's a great story in uh, Dick Schaap's memoir. Okay. Dick Schaap played goalie at Cornell, and he talks about facing Jim Brown when Cornell <laughs> played Syracuse. And he said the guy had trees like telephone poles, but you never saw telephone poles move like that. And he <laughs> was a game where he stopped a couple of shots, but he didn't see them. <laughs> uh, you know, Jim Brown is sort of like – it's hard to call him the Babe Ruth of lacrosse because the sport wasn't what it later became. Yeah. But he's almost yeah. like the Paul Bunyan of lacrosse. He's this larger yeah, than yeah. life football tale. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I almost equated for me from a Negro League baseball player, Josh, Josh. Gibson. We all, we all talk about Josh Gibson. And whenever I go to Washington, I got to go pay homage because I've heard Buck O'Neill talk about the only guy that he's ever heard the ball sound like that off the bat was Bo Jackson. Yeah, and Gibson, and just just my grandfather got to see him play, so I'd always ask him because I, you know, growing up a lefty, a power hitter, he was a right hander, but I was always intrigued by that. And I, I kind of look at Jim Brown as that same kind of, you know, the stories you hear. You know, you don't have any a lot of footage of him playing lacrosse, but you knew he was great. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't have right the statistics like you hear Josh Gibson hit 800 home runs. And yeah, you yeah. Hear Josh Gibson and Buck Winter. That was Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig for the home. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, there is a little bit of that mythology, and it's funny you bring up the Negro Leagues because, you know, I I wish that we could have almost a, a definitive chronicle of some of those guys because all you do is you hear the stories, right? Like Cool Papa Bell, he was so yeah, fast, yeah. turned the lights off, and he beat the <laughs> right? I mean, was he fast as Ricky Henderson? Was he fast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, it's part of this chapter of American history and American sports history that. Um, yeah, I've long been fascinated by it. It's just kind of, it, it's been buried under the surface for so long. Yeah, I've gotten to know Dusty Baker well over the years. And I, Buck O'Neill was the one that I got to meet at Circle City Classic. Spent a little bit of time with him. And he was the, the keeper of the Negro League stories. And he was a great storyteller as well. But he just, he used to just tell me some of the great things about the games that actually took place between them the major league teams and the Negro league teams. And he said it was very competitive. We beat them a lot was what he would yeah. always say. And I think some of those guys didn't want to admit it, but it was, it was such a competitive thing that I, I would love like you to just be, be able to be a fly on the wall and watch those things happen. <laughs> I mean, imagine if we could have seen Satchel Paige in his prime. We got oh. Satchel Paige when he was old, he was in his forties and he was yeah. still waiting and field in on Mickey Mantle. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hey, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with Anish Shroff. 
Hi guys, Didi Wong here, and as you guys may know, I am an international award-winning speaker, I'm an entrepreneur, and I love investing in amazing products out there, one of which is now Thin Energy. It is a plant-based beverage, it has really huge hydration benefits. My favorite is the Peach Passion. I am so excited about this project, it's called Thin Energy, please check it out. All right, I'm back with Anish Shroff, and I'm not going to give any great analogies like he. But hey, speaking of that, though, from a book perspective, what what books kind of made you start thinking of sports? Because you always throw those little nuggets in. I don't know some of the guys that you might do things with that goes over the head. They didn't go over my head. I I, I was watching you do that. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny. There there was a book that I read years ago. It was called Only the Ball Was White on the Negro Leagues, which is so okay. Oh yeah, that's a great book. Great book. Tremendous. And it got into some of those stories and then some of the mythology and trying to separate a little bit of fact from fiction. Um, mm. But the, the, the sports books that hit home for me, uh, one is Boys of Summer by Roger okay. Cotton on the Brooklyn Dodgers. And, you know, the, the great thing about that book is, it, is it's in two parts. And the first part is, you know, the Boys of Summer and all their glory, you know, Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese, and Joe Black and Carl Erskine. And then Roger Kahn revisits the boys of summer in the autumn of their lives. And um, it's a very human story. You know, we find out what happened to Jackie Robinson and how his son died and Roy Campanella losing his legs and, um, you know, different stories of success and tragedy and triumph um, and really this battle of the human spirit, but also um, a portrait of your heroes as not superhuman, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah when they're playing and, and they can do no wrong. And, and, you know, you think of a Kobe Bryant, right? Invincible. And now he's yeah. gone. So there was a lot of that in that book. Um, another one that I loved was Friday night lights. Was oh, great Bison. book. Great book. Yeah. Odessa Permian. Yeah. Uh, Biscuit, which is more than just the story of a horse. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the single best books I've ever read. Laura Hillenbrand's attention to detail on the way she's able to write not fiction like fiction you know those are some mm. that always just kind of struck me um as sports books that i just thought were you know they're sports stories but but they're life stories yeah yeah boys in the boat was another one that i read um i was you know i just started during covid i had a chance to read a lot more but there were other things but you just said something that triggered me um earl campbell was my idol growing up you know he I, i'd see him work out i got to know some of the Oilers. But I would, I, uh, he was almost like our God at, as a Houston Oilers fan. And now to see him, you know, as he's aged, just the wear and tear of his body, like all of us, at some point that happened. But it, I can remember going to the hill in Houston. Uh, it was this great workout hill that they would just try to kill you. 70 yards straight up turf uh, in the heat of Houston summers. Guys would go out there a little bit hungover from hanging out the night before. And Tom Williams would, would work them to death. I saw Earl hit this hill so hard, Anisha, was that, after that, I was like, okay, that is what it's going to take for me to get to that level. That, that's, just, that's just the entry into the game. And then he comes down and his, his thighs are the size of, you know, me and my buddies combined. <laughs> but he's, and, what's up, young blood? I was like, ah. Oh. And, and, that, and that moment, I was like, okay, this is what it's going to take to get there, right? <laughs> so you had all the great guys in front of you at, at Syracuse. You, you started doing the things at WAER. You got, you also was on, you're on the uh, reality show. Uh, what was it? Um, e <laughs> the ESPN reality show. It wasn't a break for you, but it was, it was a dream job, right? So yeah, second season of that. Just, just tell me about the progression and how you ended up getting to ESPN news and all the things you had to do to get to that level. Yeah, it's funny. So, you know, dream job, I didn't win. Um, yeah. It was a final three. Yeah, and there were some opportunities after that, and I was very cautious about mm -hmm. what I would take. And there were some things where what looked good in the short term may not have been beneficial in the in the long term. And I was 22 yeah. years old; I got a little bit of a taste. And I remember, you know, people thought I was crazy because um, I applied to Yakima, Washington, and I got a job oh, in Yakima. Yeah. Washington. yeah. Market 126, they're like, you're not going to try to cap up this dream job thing. And I go, no, I said, you know, that gave me 
you know, a rough sketch of, I think, what it takes and mm. what ESPN might be looking for one day. But I need uh, to go to a place where I can cut my feet and get the reps. Mm. Had I won, I was not ready. And I knew yeah. that. Yeah, that yeah. Was, I mean, I just knew that. I was 22 years old. I was right out of college. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for that seat. And I and I had to go to a place where I could pay my dues. But I, Hey, Anish, how hard was it for you to say that, though? Because that's hard to do or just really know that you're not ready. Because at 22, 23, I'm in the league, right? I'm, I'm playing pro football. I'm, I'm the guy, even though I might not be ready. That, that's uh, what made you make that mature decision or just that thought of, I'm not ready to do this yet. You know, because I, I didn't want to be some – the pan. I didn't want to have an opportunity and then disappear. Um, yeah, yeah. Syria, they teach you a first impression is a lasting impression. Yeah. When you go to yeah. like ESPN and, and you're not ready, you're not going to last. And then it's mm-hmm. incredibly difficult to maybe land on your feet somewhere else yeah. and you may get back there. And you've seen that happen with certain people, right? And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, they're put into a role or they're put into a position where you know, it's, it's frankly too much. And I, I wanted to go to a place where I said, you know, it, this is a 20 year decision. I want to go to a place where I can work on myself, work on my craft, experiment. Um, if I fail and if I don't succeed, I can at least come back to the drawing board and say, okay, what did I do wrong? How can I get better? And that was the biggest thing. And I went to Yakima and I got to not only do my own sports cast at five and six o'clock, I was writing, producing, logging my footage, shooting my video, doing my own live shot. Editing. I basically did every job in the business in the man sports department in, in this bureau. And I was there for almost two years and I walked away essentially like a minor leaguer would maybe after yeah. getting out of play and says, you know what? I learned how to hit a curveball. Yeah. You, you were almost like Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hour rule. Right. I mean, some people look at that as wrong, but I, I really do think if you have the reps and you understand like the high school games I did for almost what, 150 bucks, uh, the, the, the little college games that people don't watch, but then they see years. Of, oh, you were doing that. Yeah. I mean, when, when they see you make it, they're like, you, how, how did you get there so quick? I'm like, man, it, it wasn't quick. I put in some time. <laughs> that, was a, that was a job that paid $20,000 a year my first year there. Uh-huh. And I lived in this one bedroom apartment in a rough part of town and rent was about 400 bucks a month. And for the first, I don't know, three, four months, I could not afford a mattress. So I slept on a futon. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, but you remember those times. So as you progress and now you move from ESPNU to ESPN, getting bigger profile games, just tell me what that when you because I, I don't look back at how where I came from, not where I'm at, because that keeps me hungry, it keeps you hungry and driving now that you're the Carolina Panthers play-by-play voice. I mean, that, that's a, you know, you've had some really nice progressions along the way in your journey. Talk a little bit about that. You know, I got to ESPN when I was still in my 20s, my mid-20s, and I'm sure at that point in my career, I was really able to understand what that meant, um, appreciate it enough. You know, you're always in that mode in your 20s, you're grinding. You're thinking what's ahead. It's very hard to stay present. Forget about looking back and reflecting. We're just <laughs> we're just not there yet from a maturity level. I still had some growing up to do. Um, when this Panthers came about, there was a lot of reflection, a lot of humility, a lot mm-hmm. of gratitude, a lot of thinking about the people who helped me get here, a lot of thinking about Bloomfield, New Jersey, where this journey yeah. started. And, yeah. oh, my God, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm – sitting in that last interview with, you know, a a billionaire owner, like kids from Bloomfield, New Jersey, don't do that. Um, (laughs) There was a very much of a pinch me moment. Is, is this happening? How how is this guy whose you know, parents came here as immigrants, my dad, $6 in his pocket. You know, we didn't, you know, we weren't, uh, I always tell people like I went to Syracuse, but I wasn't like a lot of the Syracuse kids. And yeah. Yeah. Of a 1986 Chevy Nova when I was in college, um, you know we didn't have a ton, and you're you're just like man, how, how did how did I get here? And and you're yeah. really appreciative of, of that entire odyssey. So yeah. I've been more reflective now um, than I probably was when I started at ESPN. 
<laughs> hey, we're going to take a short break, come back, finish up with me. She's preparing for basketball, so he's always got things going. So we're going to we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. Number four, keep pounding. Why did you pick number four? Because um, four is my favorite number. Why is four your favorite number? All right, we're back with Elise Shroff, and I got to ask you, you know, we were talking before your daughter. I, I remember when she was born, man, she, she's got a love of a jersey number. Is it four? What, what, what is that story? Talk to me about it. Um, we, we got her a Panthers jersey with number four, and okay. uh, what number do you want? She goes, four. Why do you want four? Well, that's how old I am. So there was <laughs> There wasn't anything more behind it than that. That's why she wanted four because she's four years old. And I said, you know, you're still going to have this jersey when you're five. And she goes, I know, but I'm four right now. <laughs> so I'm hoping we're not buying her a different jersey every year. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you when you were coming back after that interview, you, sometimes you know when you have great interviews and you get home and you're talking to your wife who's a marathoner. You know, you, you know, I can remember when you guys got were engaged and now married. So. I, I love that. But when you came home and you, you started talking to her, what was the what was the conversation? Did you know you had that 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 did you crush it or were you still unsure when you got back home? Yeah, you know, I wasn't sure. Um, I thought I had uh, I knew that was the last interview. I felt really good after the second interview. Um, but that last interview, uh, I honestly had no idea. I felt I had as good a shot as anybody, but mm -hmm. Again, you never know. And when you've been in my shoes, um, you know, I've been turned down before for things that have been just out of my control, like yeah. my name. Um, yeah. Years ago, I was up for a job in the Midwest in local news, and they said, we love your stuff. We love your tape. We think you're good. Okay, so what's the problem? And, and it was the sports director who, you know, told me in confidence he wanted to hire me. And he said, I wish I could, but my news director won't let me because your name is too epic. And, yeah. you know, all that stuff starts to cross your mind. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You're never sure how that's going to play. And, you know, I'm thankful that, you know, for the Panthers, they, they looked at my resume, they looked at my body of work, and they looked at my credentials. Um, but you, you're just never sure when, um, you know, you've traveled the path I have. Hey, I, I totally understand that. I mean, when I saw you come in, I'm like, they got two Brown brothers on at the night we're gonna tear, tear it up and you know I'm mean, seriously because back in the day that never was that it was maybe one of me but it was always the other guys so it was always cool to have different guys different flavor different things and I think that's the part that I always love about sports because you can sit you can go almost where it neutralizes a lot of things there's still some some knucklehead some people that are just stupid but for the most part when you sit and watch sports it kind of levels the table you can talk I, i've been in locker rooms with guys i couldn't stand our politics were totally different but we had to work together to make things happen and you know that's sort of been the appeal of this job for me with the panthers beyond just doing play-by-play -play. yeah yeah there is a community engagement component here as the voice of the team and when you look at everybody you got to say hey you're going to have male and female you're going to have mm -hmm. political beliefs all across the spectrum. You're going to have race and religion all across the spectrum. But you know what? On Sunday, we can all get together and unite under the banner of Keep Pounding. We can unite for black and blue and silver and white, right? We, we, can, yeah. we can unite. We can find some ground. And things are so divided right now. And we actively seek out fault lines. I mean, there are very real fault lines in our world, in our society. Yeah. Also, others that we seek out just to further divide ourselves and i always feel there's a healing power in sports right we can we can mm. you know you want to hate somebody hate the buccaneers hate the <laughs> <laughs> hate yeah the yeah um, and so i actually you know for me that was a big part of it let's let's just try to bring people together on sundays and hopefully 
you know, if we can bleed that into a couple of extra days of the week, we've made some real progress. Yeah, no doubt. So, I, yeah, we talked about you proposed to your wife on a boat. Tell us a little bit about that. What was the, what was that? What was that like? That was kind of a, a, a GQ move, man. I like it. <laughs> oh, funny. I, I now, if she's if she's downstairs. If she's listening to this, she can remind me like, hey, what's the last time you took me out for dinner? I've, I've been busy. But uh, <laughs> we were, uh, you know, we'd been dating for a few years. I was coming from a football game in Fargo, North Dakota. Yep. Um, go to Seattle and I had the ring with me. Um, so you know how nerve wracking, right? Like when you're carrying the ring with you, it was nerve wracking. And so I had one of her friends, you know, her and I were kind of in cahoots. We had this plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, my wife's from the Seattle area. So I had this boat ride planned and so she had no idea what's going on. So I said, Hey, you know, just have a little thing planned. I know we got to see your family and we got to see your friends. And we have all this stuff, but you know, Hey, just one day, well, what are you doing? Like, this is my town. You're planning something. Yeah, let me just plant something. You go cool, cool with it. <laughs> so we're at lunch and um, the, the dock was by the museum of, uh, what was it? The, the, the museum of, like of history and industry. Okay. And so we're going to the museum of history and industry. And she looks at me and she goes, that's your surprise. It's the worst idea ever. <laughs> 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 You just wait. So we go down to this museum of history and industry. We walk past it. She's like, I thought we're going in there. I go, no, no, no. I got something better planned. And there was this boat. And so I take her on the boat. It was supposed to be a sunset boat ride, but it was Seattle in December. So the sun wasn't out. Um, oh. <laughs> he had boat, roses, warm peaches. And then halfway through, I said, hey, do you mind taking a picture of us? And that's when I proposed. And then I had a, uh, a Hummer limo pick up all her friends and her sisters. Oh, that's cool. So they were driving around stalling. And then when we got off the dock, they were all there waiting for her. So we got that's to have cool. our little moment. And then she could celebrate with um, her sisters and her friends. So at first she said zero move to hero move once she saw everybody. Every, yeah. I'll, and I, I'll say this. I love Seattle. Seattle is a great, great town. I, I talk to people all the time, you know, having played up there, University of Washington, and call games with the Seahawks and played actually against the Seahawks. There's no, their fans are, are that's, that, you talk about a town that just loves ball. I, I, I love going to Seattle. Yeah, the 12th man is something else. And all my yeah. are Seahawks fans. So it, it'll be fun to see them with the Panthers go uh, beat them this year up in Seattle. <laughs> I got you. Well, hey, man, we're going to head to the two in the morning. I'm going to get you out of here with some fun. I'm going to let you try to march down the field. You wanted to play quarterback growing up if you were a tennis guy. So let's see you march down the field, hit the tight end, and stride. Okay, so what was your favorite food to dip the Duke's Mayo Bowl? Uh, people good, hands down. Uh, why was that? Well, I mean, really, by default, the donut – and the mayo did not go well together. The Oreo and the mayo did not start off well, had an okay aftertaste. PB and J <laughs> double dip. So by default, that was the best of the three. And you let Golick talk you into a lot of that. So that's D Lyman, right? <laughs> he was he was trying to do a whole game. I was watching you guys, I was cracking up. <laughs> that dude has one of the most insane diets of all time. And I use the word diet loosely. I mean, on the road. <laughs> guy when we were in Starkville and at Ole Miss gas station chicken on a stick in Mississippi yeah don't every <laughs> go to I've never seen a human being scarf down food faster I'm like dude nobody's taking your food away we'd be <laughs> jumping it into his mouth like he's never had a meal before I go you know your dad was Mike Golick senior you lived a pretty charmed life and he, and he eats like he's Oliver Twist <laughs> <It's something laughs> Well, we're marching down the field. Nice little completion there. What do tasty cakes mean to you? Tasty <laughs> cakes. You know, tasty cakes is a really thing. And I'm a North Jersey guy, but we had a lot of tasty cakes uh, when I grew up in New Jersey. So that reminds me of home. Okay. All right. That's good. Uh, were you terrified or fearless when swimming with sharks? Oh, my God. I mean, I, I'm, I'm legitimately surprised. I didn't soil my pants. I can't, <laughs> okay. I can't swim. And our producer had this idea to put us in a shark tank. And I remember I'm holding on to this thing. And we have a couple of other our colleagues on the other side. Um, our sideline reporter, Chris Budden, is on the other side of me with the, you know, 
the diver in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was hilarious. Like, I'm shaking. And I see these, I mean, these are real live sharks. And I can't swim. And I'm holding on. I'm, like, bringing my head over the water. And, like, you know, and I'm not going to drown. I got all the things on me. But I'm, I'm petrified of deep water. And now you throw sharks in there. I mean, come on. Who, who, who did it with you? Chris Button? And was, was it Golick? Or who, 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 uh, yeah. it, was our, it was our old analyst, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's crazy. And the thing about it, man, I've never done that. I've done a lot of things, but I heard that's the intensity level of that off the chart. I mean, it was in a controlled environment. We were in an aquarium. I am telling you, I was petrified. I was legitimately shaking. <laughs> Who's your favorite athlete of all time in sports? Oh, it's a great question. Um, you know, you, you default to Michael Jordan just because, again, I'm always into the story, and there was such a mythology to his story. Uh, but I would say probably, mm -hmm. you know, a toss-up between Michael Jordan and Don Mattingly, those two. Okay, cool. You're getting down the field. You're marching there. Will Coach K's record ever be broken? For career wins? Yes. Uh, if Jim Beheim coaches long enough, yeah, I do think so. <laughs> yeah, that's why I had to ask you that. I knew you were the Syracuse guy in there. You think you do? You think knowing Coach Beheim like you do and spending time, there, you think he'll stick around as long as he can to break that record? Because he's competitive as hell too. I like he's both of them. <laughs> seventy six, seventy seven years old. There doesn't seem to be an end in sight. It wouldn't surprise me, honestly. I mean, I, if I were to bet, I would say yes. Okay. All right. Well, we scored a touchdown, got it done. Anisha, man, I really appreciate it. It's been good. We got to do it again, and we'll do it. we we'll be somewhere and, and sitting down and sitting across from each other. Yeah. I appreciate it, Buck. Pleasure is always, my friend. All right, man. Thanks a lot for coming on the chop, this episode of Chopping It Up with Buck.